Uh, apologies, I'm, I'm from Scotland, um, so my, my English is not very good. Um, you might find I have an accent that's a bit um, difficult, or if I, if I start speaking very fast, then maybe the, the chair can kick me. Um, I want to start with a very serious message, uh, which is to recognise the bravery and the vision of the ESEAP project, and in particular, uh, Mr. Deveux, in making the leap to trying to appoint tenure-track scientists uh, in France. Uh, as good scientists, we're always trying to break paradigms. It turns out to be easier to break scientific paradigms than societal ones. Um, I just want to start by saying I'm extremely proud to be the first ever, I think, tenure-track professor in chemistry in France, uh, and to thank those who thought of this uh, extremely brave project. Okay. So I'll just start with uh, a picture of my group, uh, or what used to be my group. This is Daniel uh, Sterber, who did all the chemistry that underpins the work you'll see today and Siam, who's now here in UBSC. And today I'm going to talk about um, scattering of x-rays from the solution phase. So this is using new techniques that I've developed in my time working in national laboratories, uh, at European grand scientific facilities, and applying them to chemical problems. Uh, I'll start just with, with an illustrative example um, of what I'm going to be uh, talking about in the context of structure. So this is a very famous painting, uh, La Tour Eiffel, by Georges Seurat. Um, down the style uh, pointillism. Um, and you can see that this thing has a definite structure and shape when viewed from a distance. You can see it has these characteristic graceful curves, which we all know and love from uh, La, La Tour Eiffel. Uh, we can see how it's sort of fading into the cloud on this uh, Parisian day. So viewed from a distance, we see uh, a structure sort of of the average, if you like. But of course, viewed from close, we can see what actually makes up this picture are objects which don't have any of these curves, which don't have any of these features at all. We've got rough blodges of paint, which are all just sort of stippled onto the paper. Um, and this illustrates my research goal, which is basically to use X-ray, neutron scattering, electron scattering perhaps, to look at materials and look at the difference between their average structure that we see microscopically, that perhaps we see with X-ray diffraction, and their local structures. Uh, and also a secondary goal is to develop new techniques to access the local structure uh, of uh, functional materials. Um, to move on a bit from, from Eiffel Towers, um, we like to think of, of solids as being a bit like apples in the market. They're stacked nicely into perhaps FCC arrangements. Um, and when we look with standard tools, that's what we see effectively with X-ray diffraction. But of course, there are defects in here, there are disorder, which is difficult to capture on the average scale. And these effects of disorder and so on, nanostructure and dynamics, are often what actually give the physical properties uh, of real materials. I've given some examples here, so disorder in crystalline materials that might be stacking faults, might be small displacements, and nanostructuring, this is a martensitic steel, uh, even dynamics. If you look at real materials um, at, uh, at room temperature, they're moving all the time, right? So concepts of fixed average structure like these stacks of apples uh, really have no place in understanding um, functional materials. Okay, so <clears throat> the tool that everybody knows and loves is, of course, uh, X-ray diffraction. And I've got a little demonstration here. So this is a, this is a CD which, uh, as you all know, I'm sure, has a spiral track on it with pits uh, that encode the data on it. And the distance between these tracks is the same everywhere on the CD. Uh, and we can actually measure that using diffraction. Um, so I've got a, a laser pointer here. And you'll see. I hope everybody can see we have the main reflected beam, and then we have all these different orders of diffraction. Um, and we can measure the spacing on the CD by measuring the angle to these spots. Uh, so we know the, the wavelength of this laser pointer, we can measure the angles, and we can calculate what the distance is between the tracks on this CD. Uh, and that's all that we do with X-ray diffraction uh, using Bragg's law, uh, as shown there. For a nice crystalline material, we've got these very sharp peaks as a function of angle. Uh, and those are directly connected to the positions of atoms uh, in a unit cell, the XYZ coordinates, and we can very easily refine structures. Um, so this diffraction technique that everybody uses routinely is an excellent tool for looking at this average structure. Uh, it's very good at determining the average frequencies of the spatial correlations uh, in materials. Okay. Now, uh, this talk is, of course, about disordered materials. It's about uh, liquids. So the question is, what relevance do crystals, what relevance does X-ray scattering have to truly disordered materials? Uh, chemistry, of course, we do in our solution phase like this most often. Um, 
it turns out that something like a liquid disordered material is not completely disordered. There is quite a lot of order left in there. Uh, and we can look at that in real space and attempt to quantify it using something called a pair distribution function. So here, this is a two-dimensional system of particles, which looks pretty disordered. Um, but what these researchers have done is just starting from each particle, measured the distance to all the others as a function of distance here. And when you have a vector that connects two things, you, get a, you add a, a point. And you get this pair distribution function that shows the preferred distances for, the, for, for order in this system. You can see there's a first nearest neighbor correlation, second nearest neighbor, third nearest neighbor, and so on. Then it kind of damps out. Um, and this sort of uh, is very ubiquitous behavior across all nature. Um, we can highlight that by showing what this is actually a histogram of. So this is an aerial photo of a, uh, a, a penguin colony, king penguins. Um, and this is the pair distribution function of penguins. This is how penguins organize uh, uh, in the Antarctic, right? Um, and uh, it's actually compared here to a theoretical calculation for uh, a two-dimensional gas. Um, we can understand this as follows. It's very unlikely uh, under normal conditions that you have two penguins uh, right on top of each other. Um, and you can see this must be, the kids must be home. Um, there's no penguins on top of each other at all here. There's no peak in the pair distribution function here. Um, penguins are not fully repulsive of each other. They do like to be fairly close. So within about a meter of a penguin, you find its neighbors. Um, so that reflects the potential between penguins. There's some, something which attracts them, perhaps security or warmth, as well as something which repels them. Um, and then we can see that it, for, for the neighbors, the penguins become more disordered. Um, and the talk today is going to be about extracting similar pair distribution functions that show the length scale of correlations from solvated uh, materials. Okay. So how can we access this? Um, when we look at X-ray scattering uh, of a material, it actually contains information on both the average structure and the local structure. It's just that normally we choose not to look at the local structure. We only analyze the sharp peaks. Okay. So this is an example of something which is really disordered at room temperature, where if your graduate student collected this data set, you'd say this is rubbish. You know, make a better sample. Uh, and this is C60, Buckminster Fullerene. And it, these molecules look like this, of course. They're, they're very well-ordered molecules. But at room temperature, they're all rotating on a picosecond time scale. And you don't really have a crystal, basically. This thing looks very disordered. And then the question is, if we collect all the X-ray scattering uh, from this sample, can we then somehow use some kind of analysis to see what the, the real distances are in the sample? And what we're going to do is a frequency analysis. Um, so basically, I've mathematically treated this data. This is the raw data. And all I've done is, is divide out a smooth function called the form factor uh, to make it all normalized to oscillate around zero. This is the same data. And you can see this oscillation is completely unanalyzable by standard crystallographic techniques. Um, Fortunately, uh, France is well equipped with uh, a great history of science, one of which is, uh, is Joseph, or was, is Joseph Fourier. So Joseph Fourier invented mathematical tools to transform signals between different spaces, so from time domain, for example, to the frequency domain. So these are two signals. This is a freq uh, three frequencies, which look like a mess here, but when you Fourier transform, you can see their components nicely. And it turns out that we can do exactly the same to X-ray scattering signals. So I take this, and I apply a Fourier transform, and I directly get, in a model-independent way, the pair distribution function as a function of real space and intensity. So now if I have a peak, it tells me there's vectors between atoms. And if I don't have peaks, it tells me there's no correlation. It's a bit like the penguins. Um, and what you can see here is we have a series of very sharp peaks. And these are the carbon-carbon distances in a C60 molecule. And then those sharp peaks stop at about seven angstroms. And we can just read off that that's the size of the molecule. Um, this is full of model-independent information. This peak here is at 1.44 angstroms. So straight away, knowing nothing about your sample, you can read off uh, coordinations. You can read off oxidation states because they correlate with bond lengths. You can compare sp2, sp3 hybridization, for example. Um, and actually, this is all can be very easily connected to a model with, with simple formulas. So I've fitted, a, I've fitted a curve there with some code I wrote. Now, uh, a few years ago, I got the idea to start looking at solution phase materials using this approach. So all our chemistry is done in the solution phase, and we, we grow crystals out of it normally. Uh, and that means that we're missing a great deal of the things which are going on. 
um, in particular nucleation and growth. So these are the mechanisms by which uh, a solution with isolated cations will, will grow clusters, will grow solids, uh, will crystallize, uh, and so on. And it turns out that this is a very important process, um, and in many cases it's very unconventional. Um, so what you actually find, uh, for example, uh, in, uh, in, in, in nanomaterials especially, is that these things don't nucleate and grow in one step. Um, you have a very complicated potential energy surface. So the potential energy surface is basically the, the different energetic pathways available to the system. And there are local minima. So this is a cartoon I drew this morning. You've got energy. You start in a high energy state, which is your solution of, of cations. And it will inexorably go to a low energy state, which is whatever product will crystallize. And these unconventional processes have local minima with small energetic barriers um, that, uh, that kinetically trap metastable phases. And those are often nanoclusters. Um, so one of the great questions is, what's the role of these in, in growth? Um, I'll give the example that, that my student Daniel's been working on, which is in metallo drugs. Um, so this, this, is, uh, this, this research is based on a very old medicine, uh, bismuth uh, salicylate which has been known since about the 1700s, and it's used to treat uh, stomach disorders, in particular infection with this guy, Helicobacter pylori. Um, this is a medicine that's been known for hundreds of years, but has an un unknown structure. Um, and what we do is measure the scattering of this solution uh, and then extract the pair distribution functions. Um, what we find straight away um, is that there's actually multiple species present in this. So these PDFs show peaks at different distances corresponding to different sizes of clusters. They interconvert as a function of time. And this is all highly consistent with this picture here. Um, you can do speciation by UV vis, uh, by dynamic light scattering. Uh, and you can show that these are actually known clusters from the solid state, a bismuth 907 cluster and a bismuth 38 oxygen 45 cluster that are appearing transiently uh, in this chemistry. Um, and a big part of what we've been doing is, uh, is writing software to refine models against this sensory scattering data and using the principles of symmetry analysis uh, to refine them. Uh, and I'm, I'm running on a little bit here, but for example, of this bismuth 907 cluster, which appears here, it actually turns out to be much more symmetric in the solution phase than it is in the solid state. Um, so you can add a threefold axis of symmetry. And as you see here, you take a, the known solid state structure. It gives a very bad fit. You, add, you make the business position symmetric, you add symmetry, you add the capping ligands, and you get a good fit. Um, and we think this is to do with the fact that in the solution phase, these things have a very um, isotropic uh, interaction potential around them. So these things are prone to distort uh, by what's called the second-order Jan-Teller effect, lone pair effect, but that appears to be absent in the solution phase. Uh, and we think that's the reason that these clusters uh, are transiently stable up here at rather high energy, because they're not able to distort because they don't have the interaction potential from, from forming a crystal. Um, the same can be done for larger clusters. Again, I won't go too much in depth into this, but one can use this so-called frozen mode symmetry reduction uh, to parameterize this larger species, this bismuth 38. We can show that its displacements are much reduced in the, in the solution phase in the solid state. Uh, and what we're currently working on is linking this to spectroscopy. Uh, so doing MD simulations, um, and also perhaps uh, DFT calculations to explain the vibrational electronic uh, spectra of these things in solution, which is important for their properties. Okay, so to conclude, um, to, a hammer with a to a man with a hammer, uh, everything looks like a nail. Uh, I started out in X-ray scattering and doing, doing solid state condensed matter physics. Um, and I sort of started banging my head against the wall trying to apply these tools to the liquid state. Uh, it does actually work. Uh, this technique we've shown is applicable to many, many different systems. This is a collaboration with ICMUB um, on uh, some zirconium um, complexes. Uh, we're also looking at the conformations of organic molecules and organic solvents and so on. Uh, and these, just to, to point out, this is basically limited only by your imagination. If you have a good idea, come find me. Um, I'll finish by acknowledging our collaborators. This bismuth uh, project, bismuth subsalicylate, is done in, in collaboration with McGill, uh, with uh, Thomas Lafrischuk and his team, uh, obviously the, the people in Dijon, uh, and the, the, the synchrotron sources where our data was, uh, was collected. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you for this very interesting talk. So is there any question? So 
I'm quite surprised. So ju just to clearly understand, is it only uh, possible to do that on, on uh, liquids, or is it possible to do this X3 analysis also on surfaces and to use your method on surfaces? Because you, you, as I understand, you mostly work on, on uh, liquid and on molecules suspended in, in the liquid. That's right, or? So um, this perturbation function technique has been widely applied to solids as well, to nanoparticles, uh, even to, to um, thin, thin surfaces. Um, so you, you, you can effectively, any, any, any time you have an X-ray pattern which has significant background under the Bragg peaks, uh, you can apply this, this, this technique. And in that case, is there any interest to, to make some common measurement with uh, uh, tomography, uh, uh, tem, tem images, or to have some images of the structure with another way? Is this something which is interesting for you? Or? Yes, absolutely. So with, with any technique, you should be aware of what you're missing, right? Uh, when you're doing X-ray scattering, you're measuring an ensemble average of your structure normally. Um, so we're certainly very interested in applying advanced microscopic techniques as well. If you have a functional material like a, a heterogeneous catalysis bed, for example, then clearly you're going to need spatial resolution uh, as well as the ensemble average that you get from probes like X-ray scattering. Last one. A very short question. Is there any prospect to achieve some time tracking when the, the structure change in, so, um, in, in this technique that you... So the, the, there, are, there are many people who've done uh, ultra-fast X-ray scattering of solutions uh, before, down to nanosecond scale, down to femtosecond scale. Um, what's happening now is that the X-ray free electron lasers in Europe and America are moving to much higher energies, so it now becomes practical to do these Fourier inversion techniques even down to the femtosecond scale. Uh, so that's something I'm extremely interested in, is finding suitable pump probe examples uh, that we could do, for, for example. So you could, you could follow very fast phenomena yeah. in the nucleation uh, Precisely. process. Mm -hmm. And the nice, the, the nice thing is, is that uh, by taking the whole X-ray scattering, not just the Bragg peaks, we're really looking at the instantaneous structure correlations, which are directly comparable to molecular dynamics simulations, for example. Um, so there's a lot of very cool physics that one can do uh, in that direction. It, need, it, needs, it needs collaboration, of course, right? This is the, the, the key. Okay, so let, let's thank you again. Thank you.